So I'm not the world's greatest fisher person. And my family, especially our sons, would be happy to verify that for you. <laughs> Let me give you a couple of real life examples. One summer, my husband Mike's fam uh, parents came to visit us. Our sons, I think, were about five, six, and 10. Mike and Grandpa decided that they would take the 10-year-old fishing one of the days of the visit. I didn't think that was much fun for the little guys. So I suggested to my mother-in-law that we take the five and six-year-old up to Mount Lemmon to fish. Do you know what little boys can do to a reel? <laughs> there was fishing line everywhere and unbelievably tangled messes. While I was trying to get the reels back together and, and untangle everything, Grandma was walking around with the boys and I was sitting on a rock. She graciously came up to me and said, is there anything that I can do to help? I looked up at her and I said, can you cuss? <laughs> her reply was, well, I can, but I don't think that's going to help. <laughs> we ended up taking the boys um, on a short hike and then out for ice cream. <laughs> on another occasion, Mike and I took all three boys to Patagonia Lake. The boys were a little bit older then, at that time, uh, Mike had a John boat, so it's not really safe to put too many people in it. Um, our plan was for Mike to take one boy at a time in age order out to the middle of the lake so they could fish off the boat, and the other two would stay on shore um, so they could uh, fish from there. So um, as soon as Mike and the boat got to the middle of the lake, our middle son caught a small fish by the gill. I tried to remove the hook with a pair of, of pliers. In the process, the fish squirmed, the hook went further in, I lost my grip, and now we had a limp fish floating in the lake. As soon as our proud little fisherman saw the, the fish go away, he screams, oh my gosh, mom, you killed it. <laughs> you know what I said? Come on, boys, let's go for a hike. <laughs> Then there was the time that Mike took our youngest son fishing, as he did with each one of the boys. They got to go individually with Dad. By then, we had a, a bit bigger boat. So our son was sitting in the back of the boat while Mike um, had his back to him. And when Mike went to cast, a wind came up, blew the line, and a fish hook hit our son right in the eyebrow. They made a little detour to the emergency room on the way home. And when our little guy came through the door with a stitch and a band-aid on his eyebrow, I said, well, did you guys catch anything? And he straightened up his little shoulders and he goes, dad caught me. <laughs> Whew. I may not know a lot about the sport of fishing, but I understand quite a bit about the adventures of fishing. Unless you have weird parents who accidentally injure a fish with a pair of pliers or hook their seven-year-old, it's really a, quite a calming activity, I've been told. When we encounter the disciples at the beginning of this passage, we are made aware of who gathered. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in, in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. I feature them just there. They've lost their leader. They don't know exactly what their fate will be. They've given up their homes, family, and trades to follow a man who suffered a terrible death without even defending himself. And now, as I imagine it, they're standing behind, beside the Sea of Galilee with the cold wind coming off the water, and they're lost. Scripture says that they were there, not fishing, not kicking rocks, possibly not even talking very much, except to scold that really cold wind. Just there. Some of us know that space of being just there. 
that time when you've been so emotionally hurt that you don't want to get out of bed. Well, you can't even talk because conversing reminds you that eventually you have to go on. It's the uncertainty of not knowing what tomorrow will bring. You're just there. At any rate, I feature about seven men doing what you guys do best, thinking. It doesn't say that they were stitching a memorial quilt or that they were planning a nice tribute or that they were even comparing notes. They were just there, pondering. That's a Texas term for pondering, by the way. They were pondering. Then Simon Peter, man of action, announces, I'm going fishing. I get that. I grew up with a mother like that. Whenever my mom got nervous or agitated, she'd start cleaning something. She walked into my house one day and started emptying the dishwasher. Some people, more than others, need to have a purpose. The disciples had been with Jesus for three years. They probably assumed that as long as they stayed close to Jesus, their purpose was defined. Now what? At this point, they're not even sure if it's safe for them to go into the city. No one's coming to stack their clean dishes. They can recount recent events, or they can go fishing. Peter says, I'm going fishing, and they all pile in the boat. The scripture says that they caught nothing all night. I usually picture them in a very large boat, not saying much, and not really trying all that hard. Just sitting in the moonlight, perhaps without much conversation, maybe just continuing to ponder. In this case, pondering would involve a lot of soul, ser soul searching. I wonder what I would have been thinking about rocking there for a moment in the water, the moon reflecting off the surface, and not a single fish in the nets. Did those empty nets seem like the last three years of their journeys with Jesus? Had they given up so much to be left with so little? Or <clears throat> had they been telling fish stories of their times with Jesus, and they just carried them onto the boat when Peter decided to go fishing? That's what grief does, isn't it? We tell and retell familiar stories. My dad was one of seven kids. Two died at birth, but five lived into their old age. We attended the memorial service last year of the fourth out of five to die. His service was at a small church in Santa Fe. At some point, we all migrated into a family cluster in the fellowship hall and stood around and told fish stories about all five of them, living deceased parents, aunts, uncles, brothers, and sister. It was the roles that they played in our lives that gave us joy, gave us relief from our loss, and gave us hope for those who will come after us. Uh, somewhere in this story, the, um, we had to stop and come back to reality. For us, the conversation stopped because the poor volunteers of the church came up and said, you're in the fellowship hall, everyone else has left, and you're holding up the show. <laughs> so appreciate your volunteers. <laughs> For the disciples, whether they were pondering or recanting, things shifted when the sun began to rise. Still no fish, still no answers. Then Jesus inserted himself. Hey, did you catch anything? I hear expectation there. Hello, you're fishermen. I know you've been out there all night, but did you catch anything? Hello, you're Christians. I know you've been sitting in the pews, or listening online, but have you done anything to spread my love, increase my flock? Humbly, we often have to say, not really, not today. 
the disciples' answer from the boat was just no. They were tired, grieving men. Sure, they had stories, but they also had loss. That's grief. It sometimes gives you memories to reminisce over, and it sometimes it becomes such a heavy load that a one-word answer is all that you can muster. Then Jesus enters our personal stories. He helps us know what to do next. Perhaps it's a direct communication, like cast your nets on the side of the, that other side of the boat. Take that promotion. Spend more family time. Call a sick friend. More than likely, it's a subtle nudge, like hearing that Sunday school needs more teachers or stumbling into an opportunity that you didn't even know existed. Calling someone that you haven't talked to in a very long time. Whatever it is that stirs you, whether you stay to pull up the load to the shore or yell out as Peter did, it's the Lord, and jump in with both feet. Wherever you find yourself in this story, may you recognize Christ in your life and in all times that you do. I hope you hear the Lord saying, hey, did you catch anything? Did you serve my people? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's sometimes hard for us to find comfort in difficult situations. Help us to recognize you in the, terms, in the times of grief and in times of confusion. Help us to answer your call, tell your stories, so that many others may be served. In your son's name we pray. Amen.